Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for chapel today, and thanks to Thomas for your help in organizing today's service. Uh, Lori and I are happy to be here uh, with you this morning. Uh, welcome also to Stephanie and Max, who are here to support this morning's preacher. It's great to have you here on campus with us this morning. Thanks for being here. Our preacher this morning is Master Divinity student Raul Rivera. He's in his final year of seminary, and he has been interested in the intersection of faith and play through both gaming and the art of game development. We had an interesting conversation about that when he visited, um, and I met him when he was talking about this at the desk. Raul currently lives with his wife and two children in Kettering, Ohio, and uh, has spent some time here on campus with us along the way. When he's not spending time with his family, Raul enjoys a good film, book, game, or working on an idea or new design. We thank you, Raul, for being here today. Thank you for your family for joining us as well. Um, and without any further announcement, let's begin our service. Please rise if you are able for our call to worship. It's printed in your bulletin if you'll read responsibly. Our God, we gather to worship you, the one who creates all things. For the gift of creation, we give thanks. We gather to worship you, the one who brings salvation through Jesus Christ. We, give we gather to worship you, the one who sustains us by the Spirit. We bring to you our offerings of thanks and praise for all your gifts. Our scripture reading today comes from the fourth chapter of Ruth, Ruth 4, 13 through 17. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without next of kin. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became his nurse. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse and the father of David. Blessings to all on this morning and greetings to all. Uh, it's a privilege to be here with you all today and uh, sharing the, the message that the Lord has for all of us uh, in this day. It's been a while since I've preached in chapel, so I'm really grateful to be here and uh, to continue using uh, the gifts that the Lord has given me. So looking at the text again. I want to reread it. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And when they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without next of kin. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became his nurse. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, the father of David. What a culmination to this story. What began with hardship on chapter 1, escaping famine and going to a foreign land uh, where there's uncertainty about what would life be like, what would we do? The end of the story ends with hope. 
ends with renewal, ends with redemption. And this story, as I see it, is one of loyalty, one of proactivity, and one of faith. We are encouraged to have hope in the midst of suffering, and we are also encouraged to uphold our honor and our call in a position of privilege. We may be instruments of protection and redemption for others. We all know how Ruth's story goes. Naomi just lost her son, her two sons and her husband. Only her daughters-in-law remain. Orpah decides to return home at the insistence of Naomi, but Ruth is able to insist even more on staying with her, proclaiming as much, where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Your God will be my God, and your people my people. Ruth was adamant that her place was wherever Naomi was. Such determination, it reveals a loyalty that is inspiring in this story. This foreigner, a Moabite, is attaching herself to the tribe of Judah, regardless of the danger involved. Naomi sees this determination and decides to not press the issue any further. And so, as she returns home, Despite gaining a loyal woman who stands by her side now through thick and thin, she still believes that God has turned against her, dealing with her harshly. She asks, do not call me Naomi anymore, but call me Mara, because my life is bitter. She still has some measure of hope, though. For she is returning home after hearing that the Lord is providing for his people. It is there where things begin to take a turn for the better. In Ruth, we see a proactivity in seeking some way of sustaining herself and Naomi and goes out to a field, bravely, I might add, to glean. And the field that she just so happens to select belongs to a guardian redeemer of the family, to Boaz. Things seem to be working in her favor as Boaz takes to her, shields her from possible harm, and provides extra grain for her and Naomi. More than enough in a place where there is nothing but scarcity. And the rest is history. We get the threshing room floor scene. We get the scene at the city gates with both guardian redeemers, one who will take up Naomi and Ruth and the land and the other who will not because of the danger to his inheritance. We get Boaz and Ruth having a child which would become an essential part to a dynasty that would last 400 years and would be a link in the long chain that leads to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So in this story of loyalty, honor, and integrity, the words that stood out to me as I... Uh, prayed and sought out the text for this message was guardian redeemer, the goel hadam, as it said is in the Hebrew. And the text in verses 13 and 17 specifically, I thought to myself, what is it that spoke so strongly to me? Why did this text and this word stand out to me? And there is something about the empowering language used in that section, that life giving language. Throughout the entire book, we see this interplay between loss and ruin with speaking blessing upon others. Naomi, she speaks blessings to her daughters-in-law, even if she thinks that the Lord's hand is against her. Ruth speaks a powerful word of commitment and promise and loyalty to her mother-in-law. Boaz speaks words of blessing to his overseers just when he greets them, and to Ruth when he sees her. The elders speak blessing to Boaz, the women of the town speak blessings to Naomi. So wherever this we look, there's this proclamation of, may the Lord do for you something. The Lord is present throughout this book, even if the Lord is not directly speaking Catherine Schifferdecker, professor of Old Testament at Luther Seminary, says of this, Abundant harvest, 
overflowing blessings, new life where before there was only emptiness. All of it is made possible through God's hesed, or loving kindness, which is enacted by Ruth and Boaz, who are everyday, ordinary people that are demonstrating extraordinary love and faithfulness. The qualities of a guardian redeemer, one who portrays hesed. And so this book is drenched with the qualities of a guardian redeemer. And we can go beyond just the mere legal meaning that it held in that time. As we see, for example, in Boaz upholding his position for the benefit of Ruth and Naomi, we see the quality, though, manifested in varying degrees throughout the story. And some theologians even see Christ in the book of Ruth through Boaz as a stereotype or a prototype, as he functions as a guardian redeemer for the rest of humanity. But in any case, God is at work protecting and redeeming Naomi and Ruth right from the start, from behind the scenes. The insight here is, as soon as Naomi and Ruth set her heart to return to Bethlehem, God got busy. Now, because we have the entirety of the book, we know, that the out, we know what the outcome is, right? It's like having an eagle-eyed vision. We're surveying the landscape from above. But what is it like for the people down on the ground who have to interpret life from their day-to-day -day experiences? What do they see? They most likely can't tell their whole story. They have to kind of figure it out as they go. Cameron Howard, also a professor of Old Testament, says, if a widowed and destitute woman in your faith community proclaimed that the Lord, hand of the Lord has turned against me, how would the community respond? How would each of you respond to her? Would you affirm her observation? Or would you insist, no, no, God doesn't do that. God doesn't do that. Furthermore, Howard says, the narrator of Ruth knows how the story will end, whereas Naomi's theological proclamation, they unfold in concert with her experiences. Does hindsight change our understanding of God's activity? So the book of Ruth, it opens way for a sustained conversations about the fundamental questions of faith grounded in a compelling and entertaining narrative. And so those conversations around these fundamental questions of faith, who better to answer them than those who have some measure or experience of God, who have some gifts and joy to share and to provide, who are also going through experiences themselves and can relate to the day-to-day -day ups and downs. This is where faith in God is necessary because we don't know the whole picture. We don't have the road map. All we can do is believe that we can make it and we just keep walking and we figure it out day by day. At the same time, any of us could be a road marker along that journey that can point someone else to where they need to go. We have the opportunities of becoming guardian redeemers as well. What if you are the marker pointing someone to the blessing that will turn their lives around? What if you have the field that someone needs to glean in? What if you will spread your cloak over another and give them security? Robert Williamson writes in his book, The Forgotten Books of the Bible, Recovering the Five Scrolls for Today, that for Naomi, who has identified security with attachment to a male, the women's words in verses 14 and 15 serve as a reminder that it is ultimately Ruth's commitment to her that has restored her life, giving her more security than seven sons. 
how different would the story have ended if Ruth had decided to return back home with Orpah rather than insisting on staying by Naomi's side? Naomi's security, it came from where she least expected it. Maybe she thought, I'll be returning to Bethlehem as a widow, and my daughter-in-law, who refuses to leave my side, will live as a widow as well, and I guess we'll just scrape by. And I think many times, and there's times in our lives when we may identify with that. We're just going to scrape by with whatever situation or issue that we struggle with in our lives and around us or within our own family or within our closest friends or within our workplace. We're just going to scrape by enough to survive. And yet, there's always hope. There's always hope of something beyond what we can see. There's always hope that the Lord's hand is upon us orchestrating events in our favor. Our security and our hope and our blessings can come from where we least expect them. By the same token, who knows what our commitment and our faith and our hope will do for another. The text beckons us to commit to open our hearts and our minds, to be proactive, and to be hope. Loyalty, proactivity, hope, this is the encouragement that Ruth provides for all of us. So we have two challenges before us. One, to uphold those character values that Ruth has displayed, that Boaz has displayed, that even Naomi has displayed, just as each of us are called to and empowered for. And two, to also have hope in the midst of uncertainty and pain. For our security, our guardian redeemer may come from anywhere and may be visible from around the little things that surround us to the people that God puts before us. Thank you, Raul. And may your message inspire all of us to readily share our hope and our faith and our loving kindness with others along the way. Thank you. Please stand for our closing hymn. Hymn number 327, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
For our sending prayer, hear these words. Eternal Lord, as we leave this place of worship, may we go knowing that you never leave or forsake us. Help us to go with a song of faith in our hearts, the peace of Christ in our lives, and protection of the Spirit beside us, and the security of your presence beneath us. Amen.